Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Recovery Scene. I'm your host, Leslie. Remember to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button down below and make sure that when you subscribe, you leave us a comment so we can send you some love. Today, I have Becky Robson. Did I say it right? Robson. Robson. (laughs) Becky Robson. Now, Becky, her, um, I guess, spiral into alcoholism started a little bit later. It was around 27, 28 years old when she started working in a sports bar. But like I always tell people when it went south, it went south fast. So I am going to turn the uh, floor over to Becky. And thank you so much for being here and being willing to tell your story. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So my name's Becky and I'm an alcoholic. And my sobriety date is June 20th, 2018. And I am supposed to kind of tell you what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. And um, yeah, so I had kind of what I think is a normal childhood. Like I didn't have anything super dramatic happen to me. Um, My mom had me when she was really young. She was 16. So I grew up with my mom, a couple of her younger sisters and my grandparents. And so for me, growing up was like being raised by a village. Like I had so much loving family members around me. Um, My mom married a man uh, who ended up being fathering my two sisters. I'm the oldest of three girls. Um, My mom married this man. He ended up adopting me when I was eight years old. So when I'm eight years old, I'm adopted by Darren. He fathers my two little sisters, Sally and Katie. I'm eight years older than Sally and I'm 10 years older than Katie. And uh, my mom moves me from my grandma's house into his house. And that's kind of where everything really started. Like I never spent more than three years at any school. Um, Darren was a drug addict himself, but my mom had such an amazing way of like protecting me and my sisters from even seeing or being aware of any of this. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah. He would just disappear. Like he would just disappear for a couple days. And we were like, I being eight and my sisters being super tiny, like, where'd he go? What's going on? Oh, it's just girl time. This is, this is great. Um, so she would play it off as girl time to protect mm-hmm. the girls. Exactly. But like things would happen. Like we would pack up all our stuff to go to grandma's house on Easter and we wouldn't make it there because Darren never came home because he got his car, he got carjacked in the middle of a drug, a drug deal. Mm. And so my mom, I didn't learn these things until I was later, till I was older. Um, my mom did a really good job of keeping it from us, but you know, I spent like first grade to half of first grade to fourth grade. We were with him and then they separated and I was back at my grandma's house and then it was fifth and sixth grade at one school, seventh and eighth at another, ninth at another, 10, 11, 12 at another. And, um, but I mean, it was still, even though I, I bounced around in schools a lot, when my mom left Darren and we moved back into my grandma's house, um, it was family, it was home, it was stable. And I was naive to any bad stuff that ever happened in the world. Um, So, so my mom, you had, you know, an addict as a stepfather, you were still pretty sheltered. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. My, uh, he kind of disappeared. I guess he, I think he ended up in jail, but my mom met my, my stepfather now who I actually call dad. She met my, my dad. Um, when I was 12, I think they got married when I was 13 So I was 13, Sally was, Katie was three and Sally was five. And so he raised my sisters and is the man that I absolutely adore. I love him so much. But um, that was when we started bouncing from like junior high, seventh and eighth is out one school and nine is out another and 10 is out another. So I, I never really had a chance to make best friends. Like my little sisters were my best friends. They were the, like the, the staple in my life. Um, and I always felt, I always felt weird and awkward and different, like, because I never got that chance to make those connections with other people, best friends. I, I, I felt like I was 
kind of putting on a, a show maybe like that's a really action. common theme among uh addicts is i never whatever the circumstances around it the idea is the same the sentiment is the same i never felt like i fit in you know mm -hmm. i'm never comfortable just being me around people Right. Yeah, exactly. I felt like I always said weird things or people looked at me like, she's really weird. She's just odd. Um, and then, but in the same thing, like same sense, like I never, I don't know. I never knew that I would find something or turn to something that would make me feel like a normal person. I never thought that I would turn to drugs or turn to alcohol. Um, I didn't smoke weed until I was 21. Um, I drank maybe two or three times in high school. And this should have been my first sign that something didn't quite click well with me with alcohol because when I would drink, I could have two drinks at that time and I'd be deathly ill. I'd end up being out of school for a whole week. Like oh, wow. penicillin that is shots definitely. in my, yeah, like penicillin shots in my butt type sick. But um, yeah. Like I said, I didn't smoke weed until I was 18 or until I was 21. But then right after I turned 21, I was like, I don't fit here in Kansas City. Like, I don't have any friends. Um, you know, I, I didn't end up going to the university. I didn't end up going to KU like all the, my associated friends went to. Um, I had to go to the junior college. So that was another thing that made me different from everybody else. But I was like, I need to get out of here. So I packed up my stuff and I moved to Las Vegas. Oh, wow. That's and, quite a change. Kansas yeah. to Las Vegas. Yeah. It was like, well, I had become a corporate trainer for a restaurant um, that was based out of Scottsdale. And they were opening a, a location in Vegas. And I was like, well, I've been to Vegas before. I know, I know like the strip, you know, Las Vegas Boulevard. I can get myself around. So I up and moved to Las Vegas. I had a job and a place to live and that was it. And I was out and I stayed there. I was there for about five years, but that is where um, I was introduced to pain pills mm. and by a family member. Actually, I have, I suffer from migraines. And so a family member would send me pain pills for my migraines and I would only take them when I had a migraine, but my roommate, we were working one night and she, she's like, you have happy pills, don't you? I'm like, I don't, I don't know what happy pills mean. She's like, here, let's just start taking these. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. She's going to so uh, tell you, teach you the fun way. Yes. <laughs> yes. She's like, mm, we're going to make this shift fantastic. So that's, that's how I started into pain pills. Um, and so my DOC, my drug of choice is pills. Alcohol is just absolutely what took me down. Um, but also because I, I never felt normal. I, besides pills, I turned to men to validate me, to make me feel better, to make me feel like I had any type of worth. And so I would jump from boyfriend to boyfriend um and it was it was a, a mess a but lot I ended up that too yep right yep. I ended up following a guy from Vegas I left Las, Las Vegas and I moved to Vail Colorado and so then I spent a couple years in Vail and then that relationship ended and then I decided to come back to Kansas City for a little bit um and then that's when I started working at the sports bars and that's when I started doing shots and drinks and like right, i said so tell us how um you told me a little bit before we started recording but um so what how did it work working in the sports bar like how did it really get your alcohol going now at this time are you still taking pain pills yes okay i am um and alcohol now yes so alcohol and pills i'm having people from vegas mail me pills i'm having people from colorado mail me marijuana I'm having people commit a lot of felonies that, you know, wow. just, just to support my <laughs> drug habit. But um, this sports bar that I worked at, it was one large, it was a sports bar and it had four bars inside and the managers would go from bar to bar and do shots. And so we would do them with them. 
And um, there was one particular night where I, I went to work at 10 p.m. And then I had a shift on, on a Friday night. And then I had a shift on Saturday. And so by 10 p.m. on Friday night to 10 p.m. on Sunday night, I had tallied on my wrist that I had done over 45 shots. And that's wow. not and No sleeping in between them. Well, I did. I went home and okay. slept for... Mm, Probably slept for about three hours the Friday into Saturday, and then probably another three or four hours, probably six hours, six to okay. eight hours. Okay, still not a, that, lot. not a lot. Right, right. Um, but I mean, I'd have my cocktail and my shots, so I just kept track of the shots. I'm like, 45, hmm, I don't drink like normal people, so... Right. Yeah. And that's kind of when I got the reputation of, like, if you want to party you call her like you go party with Becky yeah but that was the beginning mm -hmm. um a few few years later and I think I was like 27 28 when that happened um and I drank like that for uh five years I think I was like 31 when I met my now ex-husband but I I was at a friend's house and all these fire trucks show up on our street, on the street that I was at. And I, I am curious. So I go outside and I'm like, what's going on? Four doors down the street, there's like five fire trucks, a bunch of police, and they're surrounding a house. And there's a guy inside screaming and a girl in a cop car screaming. And, you know, this, this crazy person down the street ends up becoming my husband. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're still making good decisions. <laughs> fantastic ones. Um, I ended up running into him sometime after that. And I was like, you seem dangerous. Like you might be able to drink the way I drink. And so I married him. And then I followed him back out to Colorado and I lived in Denver. And I think I was, we were in Denver from 2014 until 2016. We moved back to Kansas city. And um, at this point, my middle sister, who was eight years younger than me, she had become an alcoholic and an addict herself. Mm. Um, she had started abusing pain pills as well. Um, she had anxiety issues. She was robbed at gunpoint. And so she was prescribed like two milligrams of Ativan three times a day. So oh, wow. she was... She was addicted and to that. For people that don't know, when it comes to the benzos, two milligrams, you know, you, I mean, with Xanax, they start you at something like 0.5. So it's a lot. Three yeah. times a day. That's a yeah. lot. She's high. <laughs> yeah. she, she's high. She's on like, so two milligrams, three times a day. She's on six milligrams of Ativan. She's also taking pain pills and she's also drinking a handle of whiskey a day. Wow which that is, is a also, dangerous combination. Yes. Yeah. So she, she ends up in the hospital and she ends up in the hospital. Um, I want to say it's, it's actually right now, end of March, 1st of April of 2017. So my ex-husband and I had been back in Kansas city for just a few months. Um, and she ended up in the hospital with liver failure and she ended up in the ICU and she had a wet brain and everything. She was hallucinating. Oh, no. And the, and the doctor said, you know, we don't think you're going to survive. And by the grace of God, she did at that point. Um, she pulled through, they told her, if you have one more Tylenol, if you have one more drink, it will kill you. Mm. And she came out of the hospital like April 3rd, maybe of 2017, she turned 28. Um, May, oh, my voice just cracked. She okay. turned 20, she turned 28 May 12th and she passed away on June 25th. Oh God, I'm sorry. And so young. So she, young. Uh, she, her husband was right there hand in hand with her on the addiction. And, um, she, she, she couldn't handle it. She had another drink. And um, by this point, I am now 
drinking in the morning, drinking all day, taking alcohol to work and drinking like all night long. Um, I hadn't started waking up in the middle of the night drinking yet, yet, but right. But it, my right. Addic- yes, my addiction had, I could not put makeup on without drinking at the same time. Cause my hand would shake so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents called me on a Monday and said, we're taking your little sister. We're taking Sally to the hospital. Um, she's in really bad shape. And I called my work and I said, my sister's in the hospital. I can't come in today. And instead of going to see my sister, I got drunk. And that was probably the last time that I would have had the chance to see her like aware and awake. Um, the Wednesday, that was Monday, Wednesday, the doctors came in and, and said that they needed to intubate her because her lungs started filling with fluid because her liver stopped working, her kidneys stopped working. And so she, her lungs filled with fluid. Um, they intubated her. And the last thing she said to my mom before they did that was, I don't want to die, but I don't deserve to live. And, okay. uh, and I'm grateful that I wasn't there to hear that, but it's one of those things that I really, out of all of my recovery, I've had the hardest time forgiving myself. Right. Because Sunday after that, as a family, we had to decide to take her off of the ventilator and let her go. And so me and my mom and my other sister and, you know, the rest of my family, we held her as she stopped breathing. And so I held my little sister as she died. And unfortunately she wasn't, you know, like I've I've said before, she's, she wasn't the lucky one. She, she didn't get to beat this disease. Um, Yeah. And so that is what really, really took me down Um, because I never had any friends. I've had, I always say I've got so many best friends, but that's because for those few years I was in one spot, that person was my best friend, but my, my little sister was my soulmate. Like she was, huh? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's traumatic, you know, and addiction steals so much from us and it's not just, you know, and and it's not people immediately think we lose loved ones. Yes, we do. We do lose love, lose loved ones, but then it steals things like, you going to see her, you know, but the addiction said, I'm going to stay home and get drunk, you know, and we have to remember, and it's not, it's not an excuse and it's not, you know, Hey, it's okay at all, but we have to remember that when it progresses to progresses to a certain point, we use against our will and the addiction is driving. You know, so we do, it's easier said than done, but sometimes we do need to really work on forgiving ourselves, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely hard. Um, after she passed away, my husband, ex-husband now, my husband at the time, um, who had always been very verbally abusive and mentally abusive, had just taken it up a notch and the abuse became physical. And it's because it's not because there's no reason for anybody to be abusive at all. But he, um, he was, he was mad because I wouldn't get out of bed. I couldn't function. I, my grief had completely taken control of me. Um, I, I then started waking up every couple hours throughout the night and drinking. So it was a 24 hour process and so the, the abuse turned physical mm. and I, I went to work one day, obviously drunk and I pa- had a panic attack as I was walking into work and I went straight to my boss and I said, look at my arms, like, this is what he's doing to me. And I can't, I can't live like this. And so she said, okay, you're going to leave now. You're going to go home, get your stuff and you're going to go to your parents or you're going to go someplace safe. 
And I left work and I went across the street and I bought three bottles of booze. And I started, I started my way back to my house to get my stuff. And I got pulled over and it was about 5.15 in the afternoon, early evening, 5.15, I got pulled over. Police officers like, you know, we're gonna do this, uh, the field sobriety test on you. And I said, you might as well just take me down to the station because I'm, I can't stand on one foot if I'm sober. I have no balance, but I am intoxicated. So go ahead and take me. So they handcuffed me behind my back and I was like, this is kind of uncomfortable. Do you mind handcuffing me in front? And she, the woman was like, I can't, I'll go ahead and do that. So she was, she was very nice. I had a very pleasant arresting experience, which does not <laughs> right, happen. Right. Does not happen. But I get into the police car and I'm talking to her. And by this point with my addiction, I had stopped eating too. So I was so thin that I slipped my hands out of the handcuffs and I started talking and she looks at me and she's like, did you just, how did you get what? I'm like, oh shoot. Oh. And I put my hands back in. I'm like, oops, sorry. She's like, well, you seem like a pretty okay person. So we'll take them off. But when we get down to the station, we got to put them back on. So she let me ride to the station with no handcuffs on. But when we got to the station and I finally blew, which is two hours after I got pulled over, I blew a 0.336. Wow. Yeah. And all the officers were kind of teasing me and joking about how, like, how could I be walking, talking, acting completely normal and have that high of blood alcohol level? Right. And I said, you know what, if anything, this is going to save my life. And um, it, it, it started the process of saving my life. Um, the next day, I had a, at the time I say it was a moment of weakness, but the next day, my friend who took me to treatment was trying to convince me to go to treatment. And I'm like, mm. no, 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 I'll go tomorrow. I need one last binge. Always. I'll go tomorrow. Always. Always. Yep. But I had a moment of weakness and I was like, okay, go ahead and take me. And I can't tell you how fast I was like scooped up and thrown in the car with a duffel bag and was like on the way to rehab. But when I got to rehab and they, they gave me a breathalyzer again, I blew a 0.46. Holy God. And so uh, they I'm had not a- I'm saying this to be, you know, in, in, in any way insulting. It is amazing. It, it's like the fact that you were, that you walked into that right. center. That's right. unreal. It's like, I want to say it's like 0.4 is when your body starts shuts to down. down. Yes. And you, you, you start, you start to die. And I walked my happy ass into rehab. Actually I didn't, I collapsed and begged them not to let me, not to let, make me stay. But I went in, I blew and they said, you know, our detox unit, unit here isn't the level that you need at the moment. So you need to go to the hospital. And so I went to the hospital. I was there for like eight hours, um, had like four bags of fluids and then went back to treatment. And I did a 30 day in facility rehab and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was so terrified walking in thinking it's going to be like what you see in the movies and it's going to be absolute, it's going to be like being in prison. But after after I was done detoxing, which was not pretty, um, I put makeup on, I did my hair, and it was like I was alive again. And I could feel. And feeling really, really sucked at the moment because I was only about four months outside of losing my, my little sister. Mm -hmm. But it was, I could see color again. Right. Right. It is hard because everything that we didn't want to feel that we've been holding, you know, over here comes, it's coming, you know, and it does kind of come crashing in. But on the other hand, it's like, awesome. It's hard mm -hmm. to explain if, if nobody's ever been through detox and come out on the other side, you know, it's really tough to explain. It really is. When I was in treatment, um, be, actually before I went into treatment, after my sister had passed, my mom called and 
she, she said, you know, honey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm laying in bed and I just had a big fight with God. And she's like, why? I said, because if that is God, if God just took away from me, my most cherished possession of my whole life, then that's not a God I want to have in, in my life. And she said, Becky, you may think that you've given up on God right now, but he's not given up on you. And he's just going to sit back and wait for you to be ready. And when I was in treatment, I know it might sound silly, but when I was in treatment, I had all of these God moments, all of these, like when you stop and you open your heart to miracles or coincident coincidences, it's like that, that's, that's my higher power and work right there. You know, I, I met some of the most amazing friends that I'm still friends with, and they're going to be lifelong friends while I was in treatment. Um, it just, it changed my life. I hadn't quite stopped yet though. Uh, I got out of, when I left treatment, um, it's like the first of December of 17, I would make it about 60 days or 90 days and then I would relapse. Right. I had left my husband, moved back in with my parents, um, but I didn't know how to live on the outside of rehab. Right. I did not know how to handle, like they say, life on life's terms. And what and people definitely... need to remember is, um, were you still doing pills as well at this point with the alcohol? No. Okay. I did not. Yeah. No, I, the pills ran out. And so when the pills ran, ran out, it kind of all happened at the same time. The pills ran out, sister got sick, sister dies, husband starts abusing me, alcohol just ramped just it all a, up. Uh, snowball. Yeah. It all hit me at one time. <laughs> it's crazy. But um, I ended up going back to my ex-husband and not like moving back in, but I didn't know I needed somebody to let me drink and let me escape the feelings that I was feeling. And he was the only one who would do it. So I, every like 60 to 90 days, I'd run back to this abusive situation. Um, And then what ended up really, really happening, like the final, final straw, I went to my ex-husband's house, got drunk, got up the next morning, um, took his truck because I had an interlock system in my car, took his truck to pick up a coworker. And I was so intoxicated that I almost took the truck off, off the highway on the way to work. And when I did that, I had a, a breakdown and a panic attack at the same time. And I, I was like, I don't want to live anymore. And she's like, you're not going to kill me in this truck. Right. Like, could you not take me with you? Yeah, like, just get my ass to work and we'll handle this when we get there. But you're not taking me down with you right now. So I somehow got us to work and my boss came out. Um, And I had just started this other job, this new job, probably about a month before this happened. But my boss came out and said, you know, my mother-in-law is, has addiction problems, addiction issues. And you know, she's an alcoholic as well. And so I, I know what you're dealing with. I know how you're feeling, but you need to, you need to get help. And he took my keys, put me in a cab and sent me back home to the ex-husband's house. Well, somebody I worked with got on Facebook, looked, got my last name and somehow tracked down a family member who tracked a family, who tracked a family and finally got a hold of my dad and said, we can't, get a hold of Becky and we don't know what's going on. All we know is that she's very, very drunk and she's been sent back to her ex-husband. And so my dad showed up at that house and he looked me in the eyes and he said, you have two choices. You can get in the car with me right now and we can go and you are going to change or you're going to stay here. Either way, your mother and I are not going to bury another daughter. Wow. And that's that for me was my my wake up call. I can imagine, you know, seeing my my technical technically my stepdad, but is my dad tell me that get your shit together because we're not going to bury another daughter is what 
knocked me sideways. And that was, that was the last day that I had ever drank. And then I tried to really white knuckle it. I, I knew the tools of staying sober, but I really tried to white knuckle it for quite a while. Um, I think it was about four months so, sober and I turned to another sober friend and I was like, I want what you have. And he was like, that means you need to get a sponsor because you have a little bit of knowledge from treatment, but you don't know all the tools. You haven't worked the steps. You don't know what to do. And I was like, okay, do you have a phone number? And so this friend gave me a phone number and I called this woman and I, I hear that you are so highly recommended and I really, really need help. And can you please, please, please take me as a sponsee? She was like, uh, how about we meet first and then we'll talk, but we may not like each other. And so we met like two days later and she's been my sponsor ever since. And it has absolutely changed my life. Like I have my, the type of sponsorship that I have is direct sponsorship. So the first year of my sobriety, I called her every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, now I have a weekly update that I do. I send her, uh, an email with a weekly update on what I do for my program, what I do for others, um, just basically how my life is going. And then I also talk to her every once a week after that, but we, we have, um, we call them tribe meetings. So it's her and then all of her sponsees and then all of our sponsees, we do zoom meetings. And it's the closest, most cherished connection I've ever had with other women, with anybody really, but with other women. I never, ever thought that I would have women as friends. Like we get together once a month and we have, we call them babies meetings. We get together and I look around the room and there's like 25 of us and we're all in the same sponsorship group. And I'm like, man, I never thought that I'd want to spend five minutes in a room with 25 women. And now I want to spend all day with you women. Right. That's and so cool. It, That's so cool. It's great. It's you know, great. addiction takes away and recovery gives us back and it gives us back more exactly. you know, than we had to begin with. So tell, okay. So tell us what is your sobriety date again? June 20th, 2018. Awesome. And then before I forget, because I always forget for the people watching online, what is your at on TikTok where they can follow you? At Bexy Ann, B-E-X-Y-A-N-N. -N. There, there might be go. a 28 after that too. I, I think there's a 28. I think it's Bexy Ann 28. I think. I think. But yeah, if it doesn't yes. work with Bexy Ann, do the 28. <laughs> yep. It's at Bexy Ann 28. Very yep. cool. And now tell us about your life now. What's your life like now? So I am working on my master's degree in social work. Um, I am engaged to be married uh, September 4th. My fiance, I have known him for 20 years. I met him when I was 19. Um, we have been friends since. I, I wanted him when I was 19 years old. I had the <laughs> hugest crush on him. Um, but we've always been friends. Um, so he has really seen me at my worst and now at my best. Um, so we're, we're getting married. He has two little boys, 14 and nine. Um, at the moment, I'm still living in my parents' house. Um, my pa parents are raising my niece, my sister's daughter. Um, so it's once again, like a village, um, my mm -hmm. fiance and I, we are, we're renovating, fixing up his house, um right now with the whole wedding planning too, but we're fixing up his house so that it can be on the market and we can buy a little bit bigger house for all of us. But um, yeah, things are just great. The, I have today what I never thought that I would have, you know? Right. I never, I, I, I do have a technical degree in massage therapy. I have an associate's degree in art. Uh, like I said, I'm working on my master's in, um, in social work. Mm -hmm. It's so funny because it was actually, um, interpretation. Oh, really? Language. Deaf culture. I was 
originally in that. And then my master's is social work, but then the pandemic happened and I had an, oh my gosh, addiction moment and panicked. And so I withdrew from all my classes. It's like, well, maybe I can help somebody. Maybe I, I want to go straight into just finishing the master's in social work. So very cool. But I still work in restaurants. I've worked in restaurants since I was 15. Um, I turned 40 in September. So I, I asked Chris, I'm like, Chris is my fiance. I'm like, so sweetheart, what are you getting me for my 40th birthday? He's like a wedding. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so but, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Becky, thank you so much for being here, for telling your story. That's this was great. And like I say at pretty much the end of every interview, somebody's going to watch this and go, that's me. The one thing, the big thing that I tell people is in the big book, just with AA, it talks about the promises and the promises coming true. And they really, really do come true. Um, but they come true if you work at them because Honestly, the only thing in life that we are truly promised is the heartbeat that we just had. So in order to, to make anything else happen in your life, you got to work for it. And so if I want to maintain my business ready, I got to work at it. And when I forget to do that, things start to spiral out of control. That's so. right. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, thank you again. And thank you guys for watching and that's going to do it for us for this uh episode of the recovery scene remember to subscribe and if you have any comments or questions for becky you can leave them below and don't forget to follow her on tiktok and we'll see you next time <laughs>